I want to thank you for downloading or streaming this message from Victory. We believe that the starting point for real life change is centered around God's word lived out with God's people. So no matter who you are or where you are or what you're struggling with, our goal is to inspire and equip you with a new perspective that will give you a better way to do life. And we pray that as you live out God's word, you will truly experience something more, something better. And if you haven't experienced a live Victory service yet, we invite you to visit victorycc.life for more information on when and where you can join us. No matter where you are in the world, you can tune in with us through Victory Everywhere. That's what we're calling our online campus, Victory Everywhere. Or if you're local, we'd love to have you join us here in person. Here at Victory, we're contributors, not just consumers. And we consider it a privilege to give back what God has so freely given us. We celebrate generosity and the work that God does with our sacrificial giving and in our community and around the world. If the message that you are about to hear helps you, inspires you, and challenges you in any way, we invite you to partner with us financially in our vision of connecting people back to God. Join us by going to victorycc.life slash give. Thank you again for watching. We hope you enjoy this message. Yeah, yeah, so I'm here with, what do we need? We need sandpaper, we need paintbrushes. Welcome all of you who are watching online like Mike in Pittsburgh and Matt and Carrie in Bowling Green. And if you're here in person today, I want to welcome you. So glad you're chosen to gather with us this week. And if this is your first week watching or your first time online and you're on the edges of faith or skeptical, finding your way back to God, you might want to like pause this one and go back and uh, watch last week's message. That's more for you. So you can just search YouTube and do that. If you're in person and you're skeptical, I'm sorry, you're stuck. Um, But... Uh, just so you know, th- this message isn't directed to you. It's, it's directed to the Jesus followers. So you can sit back and observe some insider talk. But I believe that the thing that we're going to talk about is probably your number one issue with Christianity. If it's not number one, it's probably in the top five. Uh, I believe the thing that we're going to talk about turns more people away from Christianity than almost anything else. And it's simply this. Christians that confess Jesus with their mouth but deny him with their lives. Christians who deny or keep, they confess Jesus with their mouth. They talk about Jesus all the time, but they deny him with their lives. And just so you know, like I'm talking to you, so that got uncomfortable. But also, so you know, I'm not saying, hey, you have to be perfect. God's not saying, hey, you need to call out specific people like Kurt and Franklin or Tim and Clearwater or Rod and Bargersville, all of some of my friends. God didn't say, call them out today. No, I, but, but for so many... Isn't it true that the Christians, they confess Jesus with their mouths, but deny him with their lives? Like, it, for so, when the culture looks at us Christians and says, it's like, they're not even trying, right? I mean, in fact, if you were to listen to culture's view of Christianity, they would say things like this. They would say, we like Jesus. We even maybe love Jesus. We're trying to walk with Jesus, but we're, we don't like love or want to walk with the church, And if you hear me talk a lot of times, when it comes to the things that I say that we're trying to do here at Victory, I try not to refer to all of that or us as as Christians, because that term actually has a lot of baggage associated with it. In fact, I did some research. There's some words associated uh, with Christians that I scoured the internet looking for. When I typed in this question, what do people think of Christians? I, I, I wanted to get an honest assessment of how culture viewed us. This is not everything I found, but this is something I found that said that we are ignorant, narrow minded, hypocritical, uptight, intimidating, hostile, and judgmental. 
And I think that's actually one of the reasons that researchers, as they look at where we are in America culturally, uh, they're calling America, and we've talked about this before, they're calling us post-Christian. It's a society rooted in the history, culture, and practices of Christianity, but in which the religious beliefs of Christianity have either been rejected or forgotten, which means most of the people that you and I come to contact with, they're responding to some version of the church. They, they grew up with a version of Christianity. They, they tried Christianity and, and they rejected it because of the Christians. In fact, do you know where the largest group of unbelievers in the world today is? America, right here. In fact, one out of every four American adults that qualify as unbelievers Believers. And the National Geographic did a story in 2016. They said the world's newest major religion. <laughs> no religion. In February 2020, Pew uh, Research Center said that 53% of, uh, of adults uh, say Christianity's influence on America's, American life is decreasing. So and right, and the one in four adults say Christianity's influence is decreasing permanently. So if you were to, you know, say, take a, just do a random survey, one, two, three, four, one out of four would say, hey, I think we've permanently lost our, our influence. And Christianity's influence, it, it's going to be gone forever. And I think one of the reasons we're losing influence is even though we're a Christian nation, is because I see a whole bunch of Christians that confess Jesus with their mouth, but deny him with their, their lives. We're a Christian nation, but we don't follow Christ. People love Jesus. People say great things about Jesus, but they walk away from his church, which leads me to ask this uncomfortable question. Could we be part of the problem? Could you be part of the problem? Am I part of the problem? If people love Jesus, then, then I think we might be part of the problem. Like, are we actually allowing what we believe to affect how we behave? Are, are we living it out? If we were to watch each other, would you see love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control everywhere we go? Now, in this moment, it would be so easy to look around and be like, you know those other Christians? Yeah, they're terrible. <laughs> I agree. They need to start and they need to stop and they are the problem. But remember last week's disclaimer, this whole series is going to be about Jesus leading you, convicting you, transforming you, helping you step into your purpose. And so it's time for all of us to look in the mirror and honestly ask ourselves, am I part of the problem? Are you part of the problem? Are we part of the problem, or here's a more tangible way to ask it. If every follower of Jesus followed Jesus like you follow Jesus, what would Christianity look like? Right? If every Jesus follower followed Jesus just like you follow Jesus, what would people think of Christianity? And I'm, and I'm not talking about perfection, but, but would, would non-Christians see love and sacrifice? Would they experience forgiveness from you, not because they deserved it or because they asked for it, because Jesus forgave would they sense peace in your heart that God is in control no matter the circumstances? Would they never hear gossip or slander from your lips? Would they always hear you building other people up? Would they feel cared for even though they had different moral standards than you? Would they see commitment and generosity and integrity and acceptance from you even though they didn't receive affirmation of their way of life? Would they, they see you making uncomfortable decisions because you follow Jesus and that's what Jesus' followers do? Now, I'm not saying they wouldn't, right? I, I, I don't know. I, I, I'm just asking for you to self-assess as I self-assess and realize if every follower of Jesus followed Jesus like we follow Jesus, what would Christianity look like? You see, Christianity in America at one time was the majority and they ruled with authority. In fact, Christians were presidents and lawmakers. They were literally the judges and juries. But now Christians and Christianity, it's, it's losing influence. And the dying away of cultural Christianity, I just, you shouldn't be upset about it. You should actually see it as an opportunity. It can be used because it used to be too easy to be a Christian in America. It did. In fact, if you look back to those first followers of Jesus and you compare it to what it was like to live for Jesus, you know, 20, 30 years ago or 10 years ago or, five, you know, last week, right? Today, compared to then, you would see a lot less sacrifice today, a lot less commitment today, a lot less community today. In fact, if you were to go to Africa 
in today's world. And not, not just, you know, the American Christianity. And, and they, they would talk to you and they say, hey, how did you pick a church? And, and if you were to tell them you picked a church based off your preference, they wouldn't have any category for that. They mean you'd stop attending a church because they didn't sing your favorite song? You, you didn't learn anything new that week. So instead of leading and teaching and serving other people, you just look for someone else to feed you more information? Like, they would have no, no way to process this. I, like, I've talk, I talked to missionary friends who are people in the world right now. They have no concept in other countries of our consumeristic version of the church. They just, they just can't process it. And as Jesus followers, we have to at least look in the mirror and ask, could, could we be part of the problem? Am I part of the problem? Are you part of the problem? See, Christianity in America is losing influence but because of Jesus' promise that nothing can stop the advance of the church, here's what I actually believe is happening. That Christianity isn't collapsing, it's being clarified. It's, been, it's being clarified. And it's, it's uncomfortable. And, and for those who are really trying to live out their faith in Jesus, I, I believe that it's going to become even more and more uncomfortable as we lose influence in our culture. But because of Jesus' promise, I believe Christianity isn't collapsing, it's being clarified. And while the term Christian has a lot of baggage... Uh, the term I've been trying to use for the last three or four years uh, to call all, what we're doing here and, and to call you, I call you this, you know, you've heard me say it before, but I never told you why I say it. But I, 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 I've been using this term right here, Jesus follower. And I try to use that term uh, and, and not Christian, not because the term Christian is bad. I mean, it, not because it's wrong. In fact, in the beginning, the term Christian meant little Christ, just like Jesus. But I stopped using it because it had so much baggage because there's so many different brands of Christianity. So the words I try to use to describe what we're doing here is Jesus follower, which it's, when I use that, it's almost too clear. There's like no wiggle room, right? In the midst of a culture that's reacting, that, that's, uh, you know, rejecting the American consumeristic version of Christianity at an alarming rate, do you know what Jesus followers are called to do? Follow Jesus, so that means no matter what happens in my life, it's not like, what do I think about that? Or how, what do I prefer? What would make me happy? Or what would make me more comfortable? What do I wish God would say about that, whatever that is, morally or theologically? No, I have to say, what would it look like to actually follow Jesus? 24 hours a day, every day. What would it look like to follow Jesus? Now, if you're new in the faith, I'm not saying you, you get there immediately, but there comes a point where you have to look at yourself and say, what would it look like if I actually followed Jesus in high school or in college? If I followed Jesus as a parent, 24 hours a day, as a bus driver, as a boss, as a teacher on the job site or in this business world, would I do that deal? Would I say that joke? Would I do that thing? What would it look like if I actually followed Jesus? Jesus, loving who Jesus loved, doing what Jesus would do, serving who Jesus would serve, forgiving like Jesus forgives. If Jesus were here in this moment right now and I was following him based off his teaching, based off his actions, based on what, it would, what, what he would do in this exact same scenario, what would it look like if I was actually following Jesus? And like I said last week, for those first followers of Jesus... I think it's time for the Jesus followers to repent. It's a churchy word meaning, meaning for, for, to rethink our approach to life and God and everything else. It's time to repent. And historically speaking, these days you and I are living in right now are significant. In fact, I was talking to Larry Bledsoe last week. He attends in person here. And he made me aware that last week on August 9th, last week began the 40 days of Teshuva. To which I was like, yeah, 40, I don't know what you're talking about. The 40 days, of it's on the Jewish calendar. Okay, still have no clue what you're talking about, Larry. Thanks for, for that. But the, but the 40 days, they date back to the time where God gave Moses the law. 40 days of Tashava. And for the last 3,000 years, God's people have used these 40 days that we're living in right now, and they call them 40 days of repentance. And I had no idea last week. I just was telling you what God put on my heart. But for the next month, what you and I will be doing is doing what God's people have done for 3,000 years. So as we repent, as we rethink our approach to life and God and everything else, we want to go back to the very words of our Savior, but he's your savior, but is he your king, right? He's our king too. We will go back to the words of our King Jesus. 
Who, who is for, so this, the words he's going to say, these are for all of the people who love Jesus, but they don't really love the church. And, and this is for, I believe, what he says will turn the tide in Christianity in America. What he says took place in some of the last recorded teaching that Jesus gave. So this is after he washed the disciples' feet. This is in the upper room. It's found in John chapter 14, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. He says, if you love me, you will, what's that word? Obey my commands. If you love me, you will follow me. Now that word obey is this uh, Greek word right here, right? Tereo, which means to watch over, to guard, to keep, to continue, uh, to heed, to observe, to preserve, to obey. If you love me, you will obey my commands. In other words, if, if we follow Jesus, right? At some point, what we believe has to affect what we, how we behave. And if that makes you uncomfortable, you're in good company and made the disciples uncomfortable too. In fact, those very first followers of Jesus, they didn't always get it right. And not only that, that very night, the night that Jesus gave those words, they ran away from Jesus. That very night, they stopped following Jesus. But then they had this reckoning. And it was the moment that they saw a resurrected Jesus. And in that moment, a few days later, everything changed. See, I don't know what version of Christianity that you're responding to in your head, but you have to realize that when you go all the way back to the beginning, Christianity at its core was a resurrection religion. That the foundation of our faith and the foundation of the church was the resurrection of Jesus. And this is so offensive and this is so countercultural. In fact, one of the reasons Muslims today, they acknowledge Jesus as prophet but they reject him as God is because of that very idea that God would be weak enough to die on a cross. It's, it's too offensive to them. They, they, that, they, and they think, and, and, and if they thought what the early disciples thought, right? If that's what it means to follow Jesus, then I'm gonna run away from Jesus because the cross is uncomfortable. The cross was offensive. But the foundation of Christianity is the nail-scarred, resurrected feet of Jesus. In fact, just so you know, there were no Christians at the cross. There were only Christians after the empty tomb. And so when the first followers of Jesus, who were eyewitnesses, they were losing their faith as their best friend Jesus was betrayed by their friend. They were losing their faith as they watched Jesus unjustly arrested. They were losing their faith as they watched Jesus illegally tried. They saw with their own eyes Roman centurions brutally flog Jesus, ripping skin off of Jesus' back, chest, and stomach. They watched as Jesus was dragged back to Pilate. And then Matthew, the tax collector, who stopped collecting taxes and started collecting history, he pins these words. He says he, he's talking about Pilate, he had Jesus flogged and handed over to be crucified. And they stripped him and they put a scarlet robe on him. Can you imagine Jesus being bloodied and they put the robe on him and then twisted together the, town of the crown of thorns and set it, or I think pushed it, on his head. And they put, off a, they put a staff in his right hand and they knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, King of the Jews, they said. And they spit on him. And they took the staff and they struck him on the head again and again. And after they had mocked him, I took off the robe. Can you imagine it peeling off his back? Took off the robe and put on his own clothes back on him. And they led him away to be, what's that word? Crucified. Crucified. No mercy. No mercy as they drove the spikes through the bones in his wrists. No empathy as they pounded the spikes in his heels. They watched as their friend was murdered. And as their friend was murdered, so was their faith. See, if you're new to Christianity, you need to realize that Jesus was not captured trying to flee Egypt. He was not captured hiding out in the caves in Evan Getty like King David. No, Jesus walked into Jerusalem, into his own power, on purpose, knowing what his fate would be. See, I don't know what version of Jesus you're responding to in your head, but the real Jesus was brave, and he was bold, and he was stronger than hell and tough as nails. That's Jesus. Because in the beginning, Christianity... It started as a resurrection religion. And I give you all of that cross in imagery to set up what we're going to talk about next. It's going to be in Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9 is about a year and a half into Jesus' ministry. A year and a half before 
what, what we just read about, right? But that's when they think about crucifixion, when they think about the cross, that's what they had in mind. And so Jesus gives us this teaching to the disciples who had already accepted the invitation to follow Jesus. And it says this, Jesus warned his disciples not to tell anyone who he was. He says, the son of man, that's what he called himself, right? The son of man must suffer many terrible things, he said. He will be rejected by the elders and the, and the leading priests and the teachers of the religious law. And that happened. He will be killed, that happened, but on the third day he will raise from the dead, and which happened. Now, if you know anyone who can predict their own death, burial, and resurrection, you should pay attention to whatever they say next. Just, you know, if you ever meet somebody like that, right? Verse 23, it says, then he said to the crowd, if any of you, right, any of you, this is choose your own adventure, I'm accepting anyone and everyone, any of you, 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 if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. That's offensive right there. That's uncomfortable right there. He does, this is come as you are, but don't stay as you are. This is you're accepted, but I'm not affirming you in your sin. This is submitting, giving up your own way, giving up your own plans, giving up your own purpose, giving up your own preference. Jesus is not Burger King where you can have it your way. Just give up your own way. And I, I just tell you, that's uncomfortable. But then Jesus is going to make it even real uncomfortable. He says, if any of you, wants to be my follower. You must give up your own way and take up your, what's that word? Cross. You know the term that they had in mind when they heard the word cross? <laughs> not a picture, not a t-shirt, not a necklace. They thought nail in the arms, nail in the feet, cross. Take up your cross daily and follow me. And so when Jesus said take up your cross, it's not like how we use it today in modern Christianity. This is not a difficult situation that we've just got to tolerate. My wife loves throw pillows. That's my cross to bear. You know, like my, I have to have dinner with the in-laws. That's just my cross to bear. My, my kids are bouncing off the wall or I have to be around a terrible cat. It's just my cross to bear. Like this is not a difficult situation that you must tolerate. No, no, no. The cross was an instrument of death. The cross was used to show what kingdom was in charge? And this was a call to die to yourself. It says, if you love me, you will follow me. If you love me, you will obey my commands. You will deny yourself and you'll take up your cross. At some point in your walk with Jesus, what you believe has to affect how we behave. So Jesus basically says, if you're going to follow me, there will come a day, there will come a season, there will come a set of circumstances where you will have to deny yourself. You'll have to deny your fears. You'll have to deny your comfort. You'll have to deny your preference and your anxiety. You have to take up your cross and follow me. And then Jesus, he steps into the tension, right? It's like he knows that there's something in me that doesn't want to obey, there's something in you that doesn't really want to follow. There's something in us fighting for life. And he goes on to say in verse 24, he says, if you try to hang on to your life, like so many of us are trying, right? We've tried that, right? He goes on to say, you will lose it. God, I, I love you. I want to follow you, but I don't want to go there. God, I love you. I want to follow you, but I don't want to give up that. God, I love you. Can't you just love me and everything that I'm dealing with and, and be okay with it forever? <laughs> right? It, it, we, we try to hang on to our comfort and in the end we only felt empty we tried it our way it didn't work and you can choose that if you want but it comes with a warning right if you hang on to your life you will eventually lose it but check out the but on that one if you give up your life for my sake you will save it right so so then our savior and our king, he asked us this question that we will all wrestle with. In fact, you'll wrestle with this, or you should wrestle with this, even if you never decide to follow Jesus. Here's the question. He says, and, and what do you benefit if you gain the whole world, but, you, but are yourself lost or destroyed? Right? Haven't so many people tried that? You tried chasing money, but in the end it destroyed your relationship or your integrity? You went chasing sex and destroyed your marriage or your self-worth. You went chasing success, but you lost who you were. And Jesus says, you don't have to do that. You don't have to do that. Your life, no matter how bad your life might be right now or broken you feel right now, or no matter how worthless or lonely you feel in this moment, Jesus would look to you and say, just follow me. Follow me. Because if you give up your life for my sake, you'll save it. Follow me. 
What lies ahead is unknown for everybody. What lies ahead is unpredictable for everybody. Would you just follow me? What lies ahead is going to be uncomfortable. Follow me. And eventually what we believe has to affect how we behave. So we're going to deny ourselves and die to ourselves and follow Jesus. But here's the deal. Every, every Jesus follower at, at this point wants to say, quick time out, Jesus. Can we just like pause this whole follow you thing? Because I'll follow you, but like where are you leading me? Where would you want me to go? What would you want me to give up? How, how far does this whole thing go? Well, John, uh, Jesus tells us, John 10, 10 says the thief, the thief comes to steal and kill and destroy. And you know what that's like, right? And you've been searching for life, but you only find emptiness. You know what it's like to try to trust people that have only taken advantage of you. You know what it's like to, 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 to lose, you know, influence. And people have, you trusted people and they left you. Jesus says, the thief has come to only to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that you may have what? Life. And have it to the full. And so Jesus tells us where he's leading us. To life. The life that's full of life. He declares his intentions, but he tells us as we take these uncomfortable steps towards him, as we follow him, then he tells us what he's willing to sacrifice for us. He says this, he says, I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep, right? Now, the quality of the, of the sheep is the hallmark of the shepherd. And because that simply means that if I come to you and say, hey, I'm a shepherd. <laughs> I just got my shepherding degree last week. The best way to figure out how good I'm doing at this whole shepherding thing is check out my sheep. If my sheep are stressed out and hung over, I'm not a good shepherd, right? If my sheep are running into danger or I'm giving my sheep over to lions, hey, why don't you go on a date with him? I'm a bad shepherd. I just am. But Jesus says, I'm, I'm the good shepherd. I will lead you. I will guide you. I'll restore you. You're mine. I will die for you and I will not leave you and I will not forsake you. I'm the good shepherd. You want proof? I'm willing to lay down my life for you. You want proof? When life gets scary, I got your back. You want proof that I have your best interest in mind? Check out the scars on my back. I will become like a sheep led to slaughter for you in place of you. So bring me all your stress and all your brokenness and all your anxiety. You want proof? Watch them nail it to me on the cross. See, all you have to do is look at your nail-pierced, resurrected hands of Jesus to realize what those first followers of Jesus realize. Jesus went all in on you. You can trust him. You can follow him. You can follow him. And that means that when life dif gets difficult, you can trust him to lead you to the right place. So when darkness comes, not if, He's going to be right beside you. When difficulty comes, not if, he's going to be right there with you. That when you're thirsty, he can give you something to drink. I will clothe you. I will feed you. I will provide for you. I will lead you. Follow me. Follow me. Follow me. Lay down your own plans and lay down your own purpose and lay down your own preference. Stop being comfortable and follow me. See, after the resurrection, those first followers of Jesus, get this. They followed Jesus. And it was their love and their devotion and their obedience that changed the world once. And I believe that we're to, as we die to ourselves and we submit as we obey, Jesus will do it again. Because you know what Jesus' followers do? They follow Jesus. See, if we're ever going to accomplish what Jesus has called us to do, we don't need more people to affirm us in our brokenness. We don't know, we need more people say, hey, you just stay as you are. You never change. Don't ever quit being who you are. No, we need Jesus followers who actually follow Jesus. Now, when I say that, if there's any kind of like, preach it, brother Josh, tell those sinners what they need to hear. Like, uh, you need to know, you know, like they need to be more like me. Just so you know, that's not from God. It's not. The, the feeling, that feeling is linked to the greatest sin, Pride. You need to be reminded it took the same sin or it's the same blood of the same Savior to get you into heaven as it did the greatest person to ever sin. In fact, so the feeling that we should have towards the people around us is not pride. In fact, Paul describes, I name drop him a lot apparently, but Paul describes, 
a painful letter he, he, he wrote to the Jesus followers. They were in a church in Corinth and they were struggling with morality and purity in a world that was bragging about their sin. And I want you to listen to how he, he talks to the Jesus followers as they confront sin in their own life. So this is not an open letter to the world. P people who didn't follow Jesus, they weren't reading this and it wasn't calling them out. No, this was an encouragement to the very people who were trying to follow Jesus. And he, Paul had spent some time with them and he writes this letter to them. He says, I wrote that letter in great, what's that word? Anguish, with a troubled heart and many tears. You ever cry and, and write a letter, right? I did not want to grieve you. So Paul said, hey, I knew I was gonna talk to you something that was gonna be uncomfortable. I knew that I, as you laid down your life and as you tried to follow Jesus, I, I, I knew you were going to struggle. And the words great anguish, actually, are, that's the same Greek word used to be translated persecution. I felt beat up inside. My heart was heavy. I even cried because I didn't want to, to grieve you. And I'm not calling you out because I, I don't want you to grieve. I'm just, so, so Paul is, is telling these Jesus followers how to follow Jesus. And he's emotionally invested, which actually means he loves the people he's leading. He, he loves somebody who's struggling with that sin. And I want you to look at what he says. He says, I wrote that letter with great anguish and with a troubled heart and many tears. And I didn't want to grieve you, but I wanted to let you know how much I, what's that word? Love I have for you. I love you. Because I love you, I have to say something. And don't hear judgment, right? Don't get upset because you got it wrong. I, I don't want you to cry. I, I want to lead you to a better way to do life. See, Paul, like Jesus, was leading with grace and truth. Grace and truth. See, the problem with the church today is we don't do that. We, we don't do that. In fact, in churches across America, you see all grace and no truth. And in those churches, you see no difference in the lives of their people with culture, right? It's come as you are and stay as you are, right? Affirmation of everything, like your God loves you and just keep being you and let's hug everybody and sing to Jesus, right? And you can do that if you want, but that won't lead you to a better way to do life. But then there, you see these churches in America, no grace and all truth. And I think that's why most people are post-Christian. In my estimation, this is worse, Right? Self-righteous, angry, defeated hypocrites is what you'll find there. But Jesus is the perfect balance of grace and truth. Grace and truth. Grace and truth. Come as you are, but don't stay as you are. I can lead you to a better place. Follow me. Follow me. Follow me. I'm going to call you to do something uncomfortable. I want you to come and die to yourself every day, 24 hours a day. And as you read the New Testament, the disciples got it wrong time and time and time Again, But when they were confronted with what some scholars call the most dangerous idea of Christianity. The most dangerous idea of Christianity was the claim that one man in history died but didn't stay dead. And when that happened, the first followers of Jesus, they became fearless. Because they saw with their own eyes that Jesus had the power over sickness. And Jesus had the power over disease. And Jesus had power over weather. Jesus had power over life. And he even had power over death. They experienced a resurrected Savior. I talked to so many of the, you this week. And I, I know like some of you are losing a loved one or just lost a loved one. I'm telling you, this is what we celebrate when we celebrate Jesus. That he beat death. And I'm telling you, that one truth turned the world upside down. Those first followers of Jesus, they lived differently, they loved differently, they served differently, they died differently because they knew that they would spend eternity somewhere. I'm telling you, there was once a version of Christianity when culture was asked this question, hey, what do you think about those Christians? People looked at the Jesus followers and they were amazed at their courage and their confidence. They were amazed at their peace. They were awed by their willingness to trust God for tomorrow. They were awed by their sacrifice for one another. I'm telling you, there was once a version of Christianity where the Jesus followers were the most awe-inspiring people you would ever meet. They were brave. They were bold. They were fearless. Not because they had great character or they knew the best song about love or they were born that way. No, because they, they had seen someone. A resurrected Jesus. And that gave them confidence that they could follow Jesus. And so the challenge as we leave this moment is to ask this uncomfortable question. Am I following? Am I following? Am I following or am I part of the problem? Right? Jesus died for you. Will you live for him? 
So when confronted with life, when things come your way, just ask some of these questions. Like, what does God's Word say about that? Right? There's some stuff I'm dealing with. I don't know. But what does God's Word say about that? That should be the question we should be asking. Not what do I think? How do I feel? What do I wish it was true? What does God's Word say about that? Or how would Jesus respond to them? You know, I don't know the right thing to do. But I, I want to know, what, how, would Jesus, how did Jesus respond to people who disagreed with him? What did that look like? How, how did Jesus respond to them? And I ask this one all the time because I'm not the best at this. But what, what if I was a committed follower of Jesus? What would I do? It's almost too clear. Because I almost always know what a really committed, engaged follower of Jesus would do. But I don't always do it. So I ask myself, if I was a committed follower of Jesus, what would that person do? And I try to go do that thing. Pray for God to give you insight to take those uncomfortable steps that follow Jesus. What does God's word have to say about that? How would Jesus respond to them? If I was a committed follower of Jesus, what would I do? Am am I following or am I part of the problem? Right? Here's the deal. (laughs) If we're doing this right, when it comes to this question, it could be the, the most encouraging thing. It really could. If every Jesus follower followed Jesus like you follow Jesus, what would Christianity look like? It could be amazing. It could be the most awe-inspiring, faithful, God-honoring people I've ever met. So as we leave this week, maybe all ask ourselves, don't point out to everybody else, ask yourself the question, am I following? Am I following? Am I following? Just pray with me. Father, just thank you so much that you accept us and our flaws. And you love us so much that you want to to call us to a better way to do life. So Father, as we bring our lives to you and you confront it with your truth, may we take steps towards you that maybe are uncomfortable. But Father, I, I just pray that the Holy Spirit convicts us of where we need to turn things over to you, where we need to change some things in our life. That when the world looks at us and when people, when our family looks at us, they would say something different about you because you must be following Jesus. And so, Father, we know that it leads to life that's really life. So may we take those difficult steps this week. May we be different because we're following. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Uh, For every single one of us, there's a next step. So if you're here in person, out the door and to the left is our next steps room. If you're online, click the link there for next steps. Uh, And there's so many next steps, right, that could be. I also know that there's, uh, I've talked to a couple people this week. They're they're losing loved ones. They're in the middle of that difficult process. If you need prayer for anything, the next steps room or online is the perfect place for us to connect with you and pray for you there. And you won't want to miss next week as we continue this series. Remember here at Victory, we don't just go to church. We are the church everywhere we go, and we have good news. So may we live differently this week. Have a great week.